Hello, everyone, and welcome to this uh, uh, seminar and session uh, with a key opinion leader, Jonathan Barrett, uh, Professor of Renal Medicine at, at the University of Leicester in the UK. It's a pleasure uh, to have you here with us today. Uh, he's also the lead author of the publication released yesterday uh, on Kaliditas uh, clinical trial data surrounding uh, Nefecon. And just as a, a kind of a reminder, the data that was published yesterday uh, has been available to the health authorities, both FDA and EMA, at the time of their review. Uh, could you confirm that, uh, Jonathan? Yes, uh, but all the data in the manuscript was available both to the FDA and the EMA. And actually, if you wanted to see the data, all you need to do is go to the EMA website and there is a document that you can freely download that has all the information that is included in the publication and in particular because i think you know there's been a lot of discussion around some of the data particularly the graphs on egfr changes based on baseline proteinuria those graphs are readily available within the ema document and were used as a basis both for the approval in the europe and the approval in the united states thank you and since there has been some confusion a bit by the market to interpret the the data of your uh, article. Could you maybe walk us through the different endpoints uh, that were uh, published in the article and what, what they mean for, for uh, these uh, IgA nephropathy patients? Yes, so, so part A was designed to look at changes in proteinuria. And changes in proteinuria are a uh, reasonably likely surrogate accepted by both the FDA and the EMA. And the design of the study was to look at the change in proteinuria at nine months between placebo and nephicon treated patients. And that is the top line data. At the same time, bearing in mind the publication that I was part of, which was the Kidney Health Initiative um, publication, looking at proteinuria as a surrogate, it has always been um, mentioned by the regulators that at the time of looking at the proteinuria change, the regulators and us as nephrologists will want to look at the changes in GFR, accepting that looking at changes in GFR at nine months in a limited number of patients is not going to be completely informative. It will come with many caveats, but that it will allow us to start seeing whether those changes in proteinuria are being linked to changes in GFR. And we need to remember that actually the Nefigard study, and in fact, all studies, phase three studies in IgA nephropathy at the moment, are looking at a smaller number of patients for a proteinuria endpoint. But if we want to have concrete conclusions about the impact on GFR, we are going to need a larger number of patients followed over a longer period of time. And so to have a reliable conclusion about GFR, we need to be looking at minimum at two year data, and we need to be looking at a larger number of patients. And so for the Nefigard study, we looked at 200 patients for proteinuria, but we're going to be looking at 360 patients for the EGFR endpoint because we know we need more patients to be have a reliable um, a conclusion about what's happening with GFR. And of course, the other thing we need to remember is if we just forget about clinical trials for a minute, the rate of decline of GFR in an individual with IJ nephropathy will be determined by the level of proteinuria that they have. So the higher the level of proteinuria, the more rapid the rate of decline of GFR. And that's been shown across populations from North America, Europe and Asia. It's a very consistent finding. And in fact, that's exactly what you see in the data that we presented. If you just take the placebo arms, you can see there's a very slow rate of decline in EGFR in those patients with lower levels of proteinuria at baseline compared to a higher rate of EGFR decline in those with higher levels of proteinuria. And if we just look at that, irrespective of the clinical trials, it's, it's very obvious to those who are aware of this field that, that if you're looking at those patients with lower rates or lower levels of baseline proteinuria who are progressing very slowly, and you're looking early at nine months, it is going to be very difficult to tease out any changes in GFR with whatever agent you want to use. Because the, the bottom line is the kidney function hasn't changed very much 
in the placebo group. So trying to show an added effect in a treated group is going to be really challenging. That's why we need two year data and that's why we need more patients. And that's exactly why the trials have been designed in that way. So what I think is really striking is with all those caveats, in those patients with higher levels of proteinuria, where you have a more rapid rate of GFR decline, as we show in the paper, you are already yeah. starting to see an indication of a protection of kidney function with Neficon. And that's because, firstly, it's easier to show a protection because the, the rate of decline is more rapid, but also it shows a really striking effect in terms of kidney function protection over that relatively short period of time. So I think we need to understand that the study was designed to look at proteinuria, as are all current phase three registration studies in nephropathy. that there is obviously going to be an analysis of what's happening with GFR, but it is going to be easier to see a drug effect on GFR with higher levels of proteinuria than at lower levels. And that's irrespective of the drug we're looking at. Uh, and that's simply because the rate of decline of kidney function in those with low levels of proteinuria is slower and it's harder to be able to see a difference. Um, my personal view is that when we get two year data and we have two year data from the Nefigard study, we will indeed see a GFR sparing effect of Nefig Neficon because we are seeing a proteinuria reduction in that low proteinuric group. It's just going to take more patience to see that translate through into a protection in GFR. And I think that will be the same across all the studies. Nothing peculiar to Neficon. It is just the vet by the nature of the fact that you're dealing with a lower baseline rate of decline of GFR. So thank you. And, and this kind of uh, as a kind of summary, if I may, so the, the earlier patients or the milder patients, they just don't decline enough during a 12 month period to conclude anything on eGFR, while the, the severe ones, we can see a difference of of 10 milliliters where we see the stabilization uh, in nephrocon treated patients and the placebo ones declining quite a bit. There we see it already uh, in, in 12 months, quite quite good. And uh, so you're expecting that for the total population uh, that we will see the difference kind of uh, being bigger at, at the two years because of the, the predictive uh, marker, the uh, proteinuria that is indicating to that which has also further increase the indifference to placebo absolutely i can yes and i think we just need to be really clear so we have looked at the uk radar registry which is over four thousand patients with ig nephropathy and we've looked at lifetime risk of developing kidney failure and while we while the data shows and again i i, I suggest you look at the placebo arm of those lower proteinuric patients it is declining it's declining more slowly, but it is declining. And we know that with that rate of decline in that placebo group, those patients with nephropathy will end up on dialysis. That is too fast a rate of decline for patients with nephropathy to live their life without needing dialysis. And therefore, if we can slow that rate of decline with a drug like Neficon, which I think we will show at two years, then we are going to be protecting patients against the risk of dialysis. Now, they may have been at risk of developing dialysis at a later time point than those people with higher levels of proteinuria, but within their lifetime, remembering these are people that are diagnosed in their 30s, they will end up on dialysis if we do not do something about it. So they are yeah. equally an important group that require treatment. It's just it's going to take longer for you to be able to see it the effects that we want to see. Okay, thank you. And, and so fr from that, uh, I hear kind of that you as a medical doctor and professor and key opinion leader in this in this field, uh, you would prefer to to treat the patients, uh, even even the early patients and not just the, the more progressed ones with Nephricon. Absolutely. And I think at the moment we have a group of patients, the inclusion criteria were more than one gram. The 24 hours despite optimized supportive care. I think yeah. all of those patients are going to benefit um, and we will see that at two years. I actually think we need to be going lower. So I okay. actually think we should be going down to 0.5 grams per 24 hours because our data shows that those patients above 0.5 have a significant lifetime risk of kidney failure. 
And so one of the things I'm going to be pushing for when we have the two year data is to say, actually, at the moment, we regard high risk as above a gram. But actually, okay. we need to be thinking about even lower. And those people between 0.5 and one gram, I would be advocating once we have the two year data for a drug like Neficon to protect them against a lifetime risk of kidney failure. OK, thank you. And and I guess that that view comes also from the uh, your understanding of the side effect profile of this drug. It's uh, the active pharmaceutical ingredient is, is known to the medical community. It's a bitesonide corticosteroid. Uh, we have seen now the side effects also in, in your uh, publication that uh, interestingly, one of the concerns uh, that was infection rate has been actually non non different actually a few a few fewer events in the nephron treated groups so are are you feeling very comfortable to to give this drug for a longer period to to patients based on the the scientific data available to you so i think absolutely the testing study showed us the significant harm that can be done with systemic corticosteroids at the doses used yeah. um and Infection is always a risk when we are giving a drug that modifies the immune system. So it is very reassuring that we are not seeing a signal with regard to infection in treated patients, uh, because that, of course, is something that we're thinking about with all the other therapies in this space in terms of complement inhibitors, drugs that target B cells. Infection is the thing we're concerned about. And we don't, you know, that's that's second nature now after the pandemic in terms of thinking about how we are able to manage infections. In terms of how we use this drug long term, I think it's going to be really fascinating when we have the full two year data and we have the open label extension data, which will tell us about those patients who do require a second course, how they respond, and again, the safety associated with a second course of treatment. So I think we're going to be generating really exciting data over the next 24 months, both from the two year data, but also from that open label extension where we are repeat treating a cohort of patients who are still eligible for treatment. OK, thank you very much. Uh, maybe a last question uh, addressing uh, the concern again a bit that uh, was uh, voiced by by uh, some third parties. Uh, do you see any any way of concluding it's a bit of repetitive uh, EGFR data from that mild patient? group in a way that you would even consider uh, the risk of a black box warning in, in uh, this group? Yeah, I've tried to understand the rationale behind that, and I really struggle. Um, I've looked at the data clearly. All the authors on the manuscript are world-renowned uh, experts in glomerular disease. This manuscript has been looked at by Kidney International, the highest impact kidney journal in the world, by their editorial team and by at least five independent reviewers. This has never been identified as an issue. Everyone who knows what they're looking at has looked at that data and said, we just can't tell there's any difference. Not that it's worse. We just can't see a difference between the two groups at this moment in time. And that's quite reasonable, as I've just said, because things are changing so slowly. There is absolutely no indication that kidney function is declining faster in the Neficon treated group. Clearly, we have thought that as independent academics, reviewers, journal managers, and the regulators, uh, the FDA and the EMA, who have seen all of this data, concluded yes. exactly the same thing as well. So, so I'm rather surprised that that data has been interpreted in that way, um, because I really struggle to understand any scientific rationale behind that. Uh, yeah, me too. Uh, I think that... Uh, as concluding already, uh, this is a very interesting insight uh, from from the actual uh, medical community. Uh, so thank you very much for uh, taking your time uh, to discuss this with us, and uh, uh, thank you everyone for listening in. Yes, thanks Bye. for taking the time. Bye-bye. <laughs>